Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for June the 5th, 2020. This is episode number nine. Today, we'll be talking about the Toyota RAV4 Prime has its price revealed. Tesla in Taiwan hits an overturned truck and a Tesla Gigafactory coming to the UK, along with a few other things. I'm Dominic Chioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. We have with us Tom Logney. EV Advocate, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor with the, from the uh, Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. And he also puts together the super awesome videos for the in, new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go and subscribe and hit that notifications bell. And uh, usually we're streaming live, but we aren't today, so we'll skip that and say just say welcome to the gentlemen of the panel and welcome to the ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So uh, lots to talk about today. Before we get to the big news, let's uh, see, what do we have charging up in our driveways? Uh, Kyle, what do you have this week? Well, I just gave back and spent a week with the new Prius Prime, and it's largely unchanged from the previous year, but it has an extra middle seat. So now you can bring one more friend along for the journey. Uh, it's like an eight to nine kilowatt hour battery pack. It's a uh, plug-in hybrid, of course, Prius. I did 30.9 miles on a just a city driving electric only range test. And I thought that was pretty good. Uh, it's definitely the highest PHEV I have tested so far in terms of range. I also really liked the fact that you could lock it into an electric vehicle only mode. So when you put your foot all the way down, it doesn't kick on the internal combustion engine. Um, basically, when both the engine and the uh, electric motor work together, you only get about half the power output from each. But when you lock it in electric mode, you can utilize all of that electric torque. And it really drove like a true EV. I was very impressed with that. Uh, took it on a long road trip. It yielded well over 50 miles per gallon. Uh, pretty good, efficient car, and mine was very blue, and it was that same color. Uh, wasn't into the color, but uh, <laughs> the car was fine. And now I have something interesting as well. Uh, Hyundai dropped off the Sonata Hybrid. It's not a plug-in, but it has a solar panel roof, and so it will actually charge the high-voltage traction battery from the roof, albeit probably very slowly. Um, but I'm going to track it so it has a little energy tracker. So I took a screenshot of it the day I got it, and we'll see how much energy that roof uh, generates when I give it back at the end of the week. They do make a plug-in hybrid version of that too, though, don't they, the Sonata? Uh, I thought it was the G something or other, the Genesis, but it could be the Sonata. Uh, it, it may just not be out yet, but this one is the, the non-plug-in hybrid version. A quick, quick right. question on the Prius Prime. When you lock it into a kind of EV mode, will it stay locked into that mode regardless of what you do? Because with some EVs, you know, if you if you really stamp on the accelerator or, you know, the car thinks that you're asking for a lot of power or, uh, you know, they'll, it'll jump into the mode that it thinks is best or it'll jump the engine will switch back on. How does that work? Yeah, so when you lock it in full EV mode, you floor it hard as you can push the pedal all the way to, you know, 90 miles an hour doesn't kick the gas engine on. Now you can feel it's not as powerful as when both systems are working together, but it's not far off. I mean, it's maybe 80% of full power, uh, which is really interesting because when the battery dies <laughs> and you're running just on the gas portion, um, you know, there is some reserve for a hybrid battery, but when you use that up, it's really slow. So it is a primarily electrically driven car, which I thought was really cool. And it drove so much better with a full battery. It also has an EV auto mode that does what you were mentioning before, Martin, where when you floor it and you want everything, it will then kick on both systems. But in any other scenario, prioritizes electric driving. And so the EPA range on that is 25 miles? Yeah, 25 EPA. I got 31 out of my just driving around town, up just exploring the new area where I just moved to. Nothing uh, standardized. We, I, you know, Tom and I, we do the 70 mile per hour range tests for full EVs. We don't really have a set plan for plug in hybrids because 70 miles an hour would be over in no time. Right. Will it and will it go that fast on EV mode only? Yeah, or I had it over 85 miles an hour in electric mode, and it. Ah, 
never kicked on the gas. It says on the window sticker up to 84 miles per hour, but allegedly I had it faster than that and the gas engine never kicked on. Uh, what are those sell for? Uh, the one I had was 30, gosh, I'm getting this in the Hyundai confused. Basically, it was like okay. 34 grand, somewhere around there. Then you get the tax mm. credit. And I thought that was quite a bit of money. I think the base one at 28,000 is the one to get. because the So you have three trims. You have the XL, the XLE, or maybe it's the LE, the XLE, and the Limited. And the top trims come with a giant like 10-plus inch screen down the middle of the car. And I thought that was really a, a, an unusable system. I thought it was really bad. Um, okay. it, it had no functionality. The CarPlay didn't support multi-touch. The navigation system was horrible. Voice commands weren't good. I think Toyota really needs to work on their infotainment game. And it was the same story with the two last Toyota products I had. I had the Lexus LS500 Hybrid and the Land Cruiser, and both were like out of 2004, the nav systems. So... Um, Mm. I would get the base Prius Prime with the little tiny screen. You don't want to use it anyway. And uh, <laughs> the, and you're saving a ton of money. And it's a, supposed to be a practical commuter you know, refrigerator to get you from A to B very e efficiently. So I would get the right. base one. So when you do stamp down on the pedal like that and, and like you get the electric system and the gas system all working together, what happens? Like well, what kind of acceleration uh, well, performance do you get out of this? Well, we'll do a. I, I did a whole one lap on it, so soon okay. we'll have a one lap of the racetrack in a Toyota Prius. Everyone Jeez. is waiting for this, and uh, <laughs> basically, it it just gives you, um, you know, the, the CVT ramps up to max revs with the engine, and it just holds there and it goes the whole way, and uh, it is extremely slow. Uh, oh. you know, I wouldn't make that a downfall of the car because it's not meant to be a racer; it's meant to be an efficient cruiser, so it's not a bad thing. But my electric smart car dragged it every single time. So, wow. um, and that's not a fast car. <laughs> so, it, 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 it's borderline dangerously slow when you have to merge onto a highway and you're like trying to get past someone. You just need to stay foot floored for a long time. It's like the, the efficiency game has changed because, you know, in the recent past, the Prius was how you get the most efficient sort of thing. And, but you, you know, you had to give up, give up performance for that. So now you can go all electric. You can get a bolt, same price, cheaper, yeah. you know, from the dealer. And uh, you have yeah, all I that performance and a lot more efficiency. I, I think you're onto something there. I, I, I mean, we're sort of almost past the hybrid stage. It certainly makes sense for some people that are transitioning, but you know, all of us, we've done this years ago. We're right. used to full EVs, so it feels a little backwards. I do want to make one last point about the Prius, which is that in electric mode, it is more efficient than the Model 3. So uh, the Ionic is the most efficient electric car, I believe, and right. then actually the Prius plug-in and then the Model 3. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So if if the Prius if, if Prius if Toyota would just take the Prius and make it an EV, you know they could have and with more performance and plus they already yeah. have the look. So I mean, I was kind of polarizing and I imagine the uh, Prius for some people, but I, I kind of like it. It's a little bit. I don't know. There's a lot, lot to really soak in and take in on that car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of angle. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I, it had a, it does have some interesting points. I think a, a full EV Prius would be great. Uh, I think we're definitely way past the prime for this, so we should, you know, go for it. But it also has a full uh, carbon fiber rear lift gate, which I thought was interesting. So um, only the primes get this. <laughs> But it was still extremely heavy to open and close. So, I mean, I don't know how much okay. that really made. Hmm. So, what do, you, what do you have to this week, Tom? So, unfortunately, oh, the horror. I have nothing right now. Okay. Um, my uh, BMW X3 xDrive 30E went back last week. I uh, did a little talking about that on our last podcast. So, I'll just right. kind of recap that. Um, it's a plug-in hybrid uh, version of the BMW's X3. It has a 12 kilowatt hour battery. You get about 10.8 kilowatt hours usable. And uh, during the week that I had it, I drove it 500 miles and I averaged 46 miles per gallon, which, you know, is, is pretty incredible for a big, heavy, you know, midsize, or I th actually, I think it's in the compact class, but it's very roomy for a compact uh, SUV. Uh, you know, uh, I, for people that aren't really electric vehicle enthusiasts, you know, Kyle mentioned a little bit about how 
we're kind of beyond um, plug-in hybrids. And I agree for, for the people that, like us, that have been driving EVs for years. But don't forget, we're still at like, you know, 2 or 3% of overall car sales in the U.S. There's plenty of people out there that won't even consider an electric car, even though it might suit their needs perfectly. Uh, these people find their way in a BMW dealership, and they're interested in getting a, a, a crossover or a small SUV. And the salesman says, look, you can have this one here. It's uh, after incentives, uh, it's the same price. It's actually less expensive than the, the full ICE X3 after the federal tax credit. And then there's some state incentives that actually make it a, a lot less. Uh, you know, so if, if, if it can get somebody in a plug-in that way and then they, 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 they're exposed to pl the plug-in, they're probably going to get another plug-in after that. I and mean, the data shows most people that get put in plug-ins end up staying in plug-ins uh, with their next vehicle. So, you know, I think there's a place in the market for it, even though it only has about 20 miles of all electric range. The best I did was 23 miles one time, uh, but under driving normally, I was getting about 20 miles. Now, one thing about the acceleration, the the like all BMW plug-in hybrids, it's different than what Kyle just described. Actually, you know, as far as being able to put a, a plug-in hybrid in EV mode, and no matter how hard you press the accelerator, it won't jump out of that. That's unique. I've I've never driven a uh, plug-in hybrid that's like that. Uh, the BMW, like most all of the plug-in hybrids on the market now, um, when you put it in dedicated electric mode. You'll, you can press the accelerator to a certain point, and then you hit kind of a wall. You can feel resistance. As long as you don't push past that wall, it'll stay in full electric mode. But if you need a sudden burst of energy, more than what the electric motor can provide, you, you just kind of push right through that soft wall, and then the ICE engine jumps in, adds horsepower, and you can take off. That's how the, the BMW plug-in hybrid systems work on, on all their, um, their, their plug-in hybrid cars right now. So that's what the, the, the X, how the X3 worked. Now, it needs it because it only has 107 horsepower electric motor. So when you're in full electric mode, you've only got 107 horsepower for a 4,500-pound vehicle. So it, it's, it's not peppy. You know, you don't get that instant torque that you feel in normal most electric cars. And when you need a sudden burst of acceleration to jump out on the highway or to pass someone or clear an intersection – uh, you need the the ice to jump in and help out, uh, but then it'll it it, it 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 shuts back off if you um, if you're if your driving shows that you don't need it as long as you're in max e drive. So those systems are different. I'm I'd, I'd, I'm interested in driving the, uh, Kyle's vehicle that you were testing just just to test that out because I've never actually had a plug in hybrid that that operates that way where no matter how hard you press the accelerator it won't let the ice join in. That's 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 interesting. Yeah, I really like um, BMW's way of doing thing with the kit kick down switch, basically activating the ice. But, uh, you know, we were talking about this a little bit last week, maybe off the air. And um, I was trying to remember a car that I had driven not too long ago. I couldn't remember what it was, where it was actually a moving wall. So on the back side of the accelerator pedal, a little electric motor plastic arm would come out and create that wall, depending on how much power was left, you know, based on state of charge or speed. Uh -huh. And it was the Porsche plug-in hybrids. So like the Cayenne uh, SE uh, e-hybrid or the Panamera e-hybrid, those uh, basically when you're at a stop, you get a lot of pedal movement because you get more. And as the battery discharges, it moves that wall back and you can push through. I thought that was really cool. Might be complicated. I think BMW solution leads to less maintenance down the road. <laughs> but and it works. It works well. You can clearly feel where that wall is as you're pressing the accelerator. And if you don't want the ice engine to jump in, it's very easy to keep it out of you know the hybrid mode to keep it in pure electric. And I had my X3 up to over 80 miles an hour on the highway, and uh, it, the ice engine didn't join in. At some speed, it will, but. Um, I, I wasn't able to get it to, 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 to turn on. So that car's back, and now I'm going to be getting, uh, uh, this week coming up, I'm going to be getting a Hyundai Kona. Kyle, you just had one, so I'm going to coordinate with you some of the things you did. Maybe I could find some things that you didn't do, although that's difficult because you basically do everything when you get the cars. Yeah, I left um, a note in it for you. It's hidden oh. under the passenger seat. But I'd also like <laughs> to put out to the uh, Inside EVs community uh, to let us know in the comments section of this podcast if there's anything specific 
you'd like me to test out with the 2020 uh, Kona Electric. Right on. Um, actually, yeah, I'd like to know if there's any, if you hear any noises. We have a, a big thread on just like some weird noises on the inside EV's forum. There's like one of our biggest threads. Some people have had like uh, motor issues, so motor replace, but it's like there's two separate things going on. There's like that kind of noise and there's some sort of, I don't know if it's like an inverter whine, there's some sort of sound that some it really, really bothers some owners and then most, but most of them either don't experience or, or don't have any issue with it. But uh, besides not having a car, this, this week, you did have like a, a charger, like you're our inside EVs charger specialist. If you see Tom's garage, one wall is like, it's a wall of charger or EVSE, electric vehicle supply equipment is like the technical name. It's like the wall unit that you need to mount in your garage so you can take full advantage of the onboard charger in your car. So what did you, what did you have for us this week? Yeah, so um, uh, I got uh, from United Chargers out of Canada, they came out with a charger called the Grizzle E, <laughs> like a grizzly bear, I guess, uh, from Canada. So, um, and, and their logo is even like claw marks across the front of the, uh, the charger. So um, it's, it's, a level, it's a level two charging station, EVSC charger, whatever you want to call it. I, you know, I, I think people get a little hypersensitive when we call them chargers and charging stations. And there's that's EVSC. Uh, okay. Uh, technically it is. The reason why on inside EVs we call them chargers or charging stations is because that's what most people understand and call them. And that's what the companies that are selling them call them. Go to ChargePoint or NL or Clipper Creek or Grizzly's website and see what they're called. They call them chargers or charging stations. We know that's not technically correct but it's what the people understand, what customers search for online. So that's what we've, we've given into the fact that that's what people are going to recognize them as, even though that's not technically what they're called. Um, so yeah, this, the Grizzle E is a level two charging station. It goes up to 40 amps, um, uh, which is, and the interesting thing about it, like the Tesla wall connector, uh, it has internal dip switches that allow you to throttle down the power to 16 amps, 24 amps, or 32 amps. Now, why would that be important? A lot of people want to ask, well, you might have a circuit, you might not be able to support a, a dedicated 50 amp circuit in your house. Your electrical service might not have the capacity to do that. So you can only say have a, a 40 amp circuit or a, a, a 30 amp circuit. And uh, so you need to then limit the amount of power that the charger can supply to the car or you'll overload the circuit. And some of the smart chargers allow you to do that in, a, in an app, which seems really convenient. It, it, it is really convenient. The only problem is it runs afoul with electrical codes because you can then accidentally raise the power of, of the charger and overload your circuit. So there's a lot of electrical inspectors won't pass your, um, you, you know, won't, 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 won't pass the insulation of the outlet and the charger if you uh, don't have it set internally so that it can't mistakenly be increased. So that's one, one of the features that it has that's really good. It has a, a all aluminum case that's tough as heck. Um, a lot of people comment that it looks like the original juice box. Um, it's not connected to uh, the original juice box. It's just that they basically used an off-the-shelf NEMA 4 enclosure like eMotorworks did when they first came out with the juice box. So, yeah, it, it looks like the original juice box. Once you open them up and take a look inside, which I did and posted pictures of it, it's, it, it looks nothing like the, uh, the juice box. And anyway, it's not a quote-unquote smart charger like the juice box is. It's, it's, it's basically just plug it in, plug it into the car, and it charges your car um, relatively quickly. Now, United uh, Chargers is coming out with an upgrade kit for this. So if you buy it now and then you decide you want a smart charger, you'll be able to literally buy this from them, open the box up and plug in the modules that will turn it into a smart charger with a full smartphone app and uh, and be able to use it that way. I've, I've never seen uh, any of the, the charging products we have uh, allow you to do that. Buy it this way and then upgrade it to... Um, uh, to, to being a smart charger. It's all UL um, listed. It's a, been safety certified. Uh, and uh, it has a premium cable that's good for very cold weather. Selling this equipment up in Canada, they have to be cognizant of the fact that they have extreme winters. 
So if the cable doesn't remain flexible and really cold, I mean, it, it, some of these cables are like frozen garden hoses. When you, when you, when you try to uncoil them to unplug your car, the whole cable falls off the, the, the cable management system and, and you can't even straighten it out. Um, especially some of the less expensive uh, charging equipment that comes from China these days. Um, a lot of the cables are super low budget, super inexpensive, and they freeze like a rock when, <laughs> when it gets cold out. The, the Grizzly offers a premium cable that won't do that, that remains nice and rubbery and pliable even in the coldest temperature. So, so uh, uh, check so that out. So one point, so Tom, you, you check these things pretty rigorously. You actually take that, when you receive this unit, you actually take the cord off and you stick it in the freezer overnight or something? So I don't take the cord off. I put the whole unit in a, in a, in a, in a chest freezer okay. and um, le leave it there overnight. And then in the morning, I'll uh, plug it in and uh, see how the, the, the cable uh, works. Well, I don't have to plug it in, but I end up doing that anyway. And see just how pliable the cable is and how, uh, you know, it, 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 whether it stays frozen or it uncoils nice and easily. Um, I'm going to eventually, I haven't, I haven't done that yet, but I'm going to start recording videos of each of the chargers that I have. And I have over 20 products now in my garage um, that um, how the cables for each one of them perform when they're uh, frozen overnight. Right on. That's crazy. That's lots of, uh, that's some quality testing right there. Okay. So moving on, we got a bunch of things to talk about. So the big thing, we were just talking about the, the Prius Prime and uh, plug-in plug -in electric vehicles. Um, so Toyota has revealed the pricing for the 2021 RAV4 Prime plug-in hybrid. Uh, this is going to be a big vehicle, I, I feel like. There's a lot of uh, excitement about it in our uh, Inside EVs uh, forum community. The the Clarity owners especially, they started their own thread in the, in the Clarity section besides the Toyota section. Um, and they're already used to driving like the plug-in hybrid uh, Honda Clarity. So they like, they, they're already, you know, they like the idea of a plug-in hybrid. And this, this one gets 42 miles on the charge EPA, which is, you know, very good for a vehicle of this size. And it's also, uh, you know, you know, it's unlike the Prius, this will be the, has like decent performance. It'll be the fastest four door Toyota, I believe they have, or the quickest. Um, it's like a zero to 60 of 5.7 seconds, which is, that's under six seconds, which, you know, six seconds used to be the, the standard mark for like sports cars, not that long ago, you know, maybe, you know, 15 years ago, like, and before, like a sub six second car was, you know, a sports car. And here we have like this Toyota RAV4 crossover hybrid, it's, you know, f quicker than that. So uh, are you excited about this, Ryan, or uh, Kyle? <laughs> You know, you're not the first person to do that. A lot of people call me Ryan. I'm not sure why. Uh, I think no, the, the plug-in hybrid RAV4 is not a bad option at all. I think it's one of the highest range plug-in hybrid EVs. Uh, it'll also, on a higher scale, the BMW X5 40. 5e i think is what it's going to be called i think we'll have close to 50 miles of range so we're starting to see these big plug-in hybrid uh electric vehicles that i think are, are important to have big battery packs in uh, you know one of the things that we were talking about on my side when uh, Alyssa, my girlfriend drives an i3 was she wanted to do most of her driving on electric but wanted to have that gasoline engine as a backup, which is why we decided to get a Rex. And a RAV4 plug-in hybrid would have actually fit the bill for us because it can hold the dogs, sort of a high riding position, and she can do all of her driving, which like at a day, maybe 30, 40 miles, uh, a comfortably an electric mode only. So I think this is, like you said, is going to be a hot car Everyone's going to go for it. I'm pretty sure there's already a waiting list at dealers for them. And uh, I'm really excited for this because it, it means that you're going to get that Toyota build quality, the longevity, the reliability in a really good looking actually crossover that's electrified. It's sort of the perfect storm of everything. And, and the, so I mentioned the, the pricing was revealed and I didn't mention the pricing. It's a, uh, $38,100 and add on $1,120 for uh, uh, delivery processing handling. But then you take off the the federal tax credit and it comes down to $31,720. 
maybe that's that's a deal. That's for the SE version, and you can move up to the X SE, and that starts out at forty one thousand. You do all the tax credit stuff, and that's thirty five thousand dollars, and that's not including whatever local incentives you have as well. That's that's quite a deal. What do you think about this here, Tom? So you know, I have mixed emotions with the Rav Four uh, Prime. It's 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 a great vehicle. I I just wish it was coming from a different company. <laughs> um, you know, Toyota has been so anti EV um, that it's hard. For, it's really at this point, it's hard for me to get behind them as a company. Almost harder than any other established OEM. You know, Toyota uh, they ha they came. This is like the third generation Rav Four electric that they came out with. The first two were all electric, and the people that own them absolutely love them. Uh, you know, this this really should be an all electric RAV4. Um, it's a shame that it's not. It's still a good vehicle, but Toyota is just just clinging their claws to hybrids. They just Preach. won't let hybrids die, and that's because you know they they've sold you know I don't know how many 15 million hybrids worldwide or something. Um, at one point. Toyota controlled 80% of the worldwide sales of hybrids. There's like no other manufacturer that controls 80% of a particular type of vehicle in worldwide. You know, so the, I mean, they, that, that, that's why people wonder, well, oh, they had such this head start with, with, with um, you know, electrification with the Prius and they've done. Why is Toyota dragging their feet? Well, it's all about money. It's all about the fact that they control the market with hybrids. They know they will never control the market with full electric cars. They're, they're already too far behind to, 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 to ever be in that position where they will dominate worldwide sales with fully electric cars. So they're slow walking this as much as they can. Yes, the RAV4 Prime, I think, is a great, looks like it's a great uh, plug-in hybrid. I mean, 40 miles of range. It's got to have, um, I don't think Toyota's released the exact size of the battery, but they've already said it's going to qualify for the full $7,500 tax credit in the U.S. So that means it's got to be greater than 16 kilowatt hours. And it's got to be greater than 16 kilowatt hours if the vehicle goes 42 miles of all electric range. But um, so it's, it, you know, on paper, it's a, it's, it's a great, you know, small SUV crossover plug-in hybrid. I just, I have such a bad taste in my mouth with, for, to, with Toyota that I, I just can't get on board with it. I'm sorry. I know they're going to sell well. But um, I just have a thing with Toyota with how they've really dramatically tried to slow down electrification that, um, you know, no matter how good it is, I wouldn't buy one personally. Well, they do make that one electric vehicle, the iRoad, uh, but they don't sell it here. And it's, you know, only a couple of uh, like a like a couple of different programs. They have a program somewhere in, in New York or a couple of places, I think. And I thought they were going away. So this is like the, the little three wheel thing and, and the rear wheel does the steering. It's kind of neat, but it doesn't go super fast. It's like a 30 mile an hour kind of vehicle. But, and I thought that was going away, but then I just saw them, they rolled out another project with it and maybe Hokkaido, but that was free COVID. So, you know, that's up in the air, but I was kind of, a, kind of disappointed. It didn't try to you know, develop that into something of a more, more, more mainstream vehicle, a little higher speeds and because uh, it leans as well. Right. And why would they, then people might want it. Uh, right. It looked like a lot of fun. And pe the people I, you know, heard about driving it, test driving it, you know, they loved, it was like, a blast to drive even though it's you know not a high-speed vehicle but yeah it's kind of sad to see them like behind the times like that uh martin you have anything any uh, any thoughts about the hybrid uh the rav4 prime uh, i'm with tom on this i'm with tom because toyota is a, a global company with a global footprint and in a in a global world not just because of social media but because the world's become a smaller place you can't advertise one type of technology somewhere by talking down the alternatives. So, for instance, in this country, uh, their their slogan is Toyota. We choose not to plug in, right? So that that's their their strap line. They've run adverts in the past here of their hybrids driving past chargers with cobwebs on. They had a recent YouTube uh, video that was probably a, a maybe a TV campaign somewhere where their hybrid speeds past somebody in the middle of the desert. So they'd placed a full EV and a, an electric car charger, uh, sort of very a la Tesla supercharger style, and a guy charging his car in the middle of the desert 
uh, holding the electric cable like you would hold a petrol pump. So holding that uh, and looking at his watch and then a hybrid uh, speeds past. So I don't know how you well obviously i do know how you 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 justify that whereas as tom says when your market share is so big when you're making so much money when you're so invested in making combustion engines when you're so good at it as well and they're so proud of their processes for making uh, combustion cars and hybrid cars as well the the danger is like so many so many normal people are now noticing that hang on a minute you're talking out of both sides of your mouth now be really really as a as a big company be really, really careful in 2020 not to treat people like suckers because people notice and they catch on and they'll vote with their wallets as well. So as Tom says, I would never in a million years support a company that says we choose not to plug in and then goes, hey, we've got a great plug in hybrid for this market. But wait, in China, where we have to sell EVs with uh, 1.2 billion uh, factory investment with uh, their joint venture with FAW. Hey, no, in China, we're making full EVs. Full EVs are great. Okay, do you, do you really think that? No, don't buy a full EV. Buy a, a plug-in. Really? Do you believe that? No, buy a soft hybrid that's got, that hasn't got a plug socket on, depending on which country slash set of emissions regulations you're trying to uh, appeal to. Uh, just be... Be really careful not to treat people like idiots because we're not. And it's not an industry thing of people watching, you know, us four and you watching this. It's not an insular EV thing. People notice. And so they've got to navigate their way out of this. Like the, in, the, they started the whole self-charging hybrid thing. And now the South Korean companies are, are catching on with that as well. And it causes enormous confusion. You know, they're, they're in trouble in uh, Norway, at least one of the Nordic countries, over that messaging with their advertising bodies. Now here they've cleared it because they argued their case, and this, so in this country they've done nothing, nothing wrong with that message. But you know, I, I hate to use a sample size of one, but my father-in-law was a mechanic all of his life. And he's retired now, and he saw the advert come on TV. This was a couple of years ago, and we were around there to see my in-laws. And and after the ad came on, he looked at me and went, "Well, that's clever, self-charging. How have they done that?" And I'm like, "It's just, it's just a, they've done nothing. It's just a, a new slogan." But I think that misleads people, and uh, they would disagree with me, of course. My opinion is that it that is not a uh, a, a great way to behave as a global company, and so. You know, I, I'm aware that I've gone on a a, a polite rant there. A Toyota rant. It's, it's all right. Well, it's, <laughs> it's it's a nice it's a nice rant. I wasn't I wasn't shouting. I wasn't shouting at anyone. But it's it's more disappointment because the people at Toyota, the engineers, are so talented. And if they were allowed mm. to make a great EV, they would have made one years ago. It's not it's not the people on the ground. It's the ideology of the whole right. thing and the and the craziness of the marketing. I'll stop I agree now. with that. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm sure there's a whole engineering group that wants to build the coolest next cool EV that's going to blow everyone away. Um, I see your point about the company and how it operates. I just think most people are going to go looking around, right? Whether it's through marketing or just on dealer lots. And they're already buying RAV4s, right? So they're already going to go for them. And if you just look at it from a car, the RAV4 this one is a great, very high volume vehicle that now you can get more people to drive a significant portion of electric on. And uh, to Tom's point, you know, for us, we've done the whole gateway to EV thing a long time ago, but the significant portion of the car buyers are still to come. So I think this is a great way to take a mass market vehicle, sort of give anyone no reason not to buy it over the internal combustion version and now we're transitioning more to sustainable transport in a, I understand, <laughs> a flawed sort of marketing style company, however that is. But from a car's perspective, I actually think it'll be pretty good. I should point out that the, uh, Toyota actually does have a, uh, the Pro Ace electric delivery van coming out soon as well. Uh, that's like an all electric van. Uh, I believe it's only for Europe, probably Japan. That's, the ba that, 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 that's a badge engineered uh, PSA uh, platform. So oh, it's on the PSA platform. I know. P I know. Uh, PSA has a, a a passenger version of it as well coming up soon with windows. Yeah, so on the it's, it's called different things in different countries. But there's the right. Peugeot, the Citroen, the uh, it, it uses even the same tech that's going into things like the Peugeot E208 and the DS3 
crossback e tense crazy name and um but no that's not they've done nothing they've done nothing for that apart so from take tech no, so knowledge the that's there and and they've got the little toyota badge to stick on the front of it I, i'm i'm being slightly flippant they've done more than that but that's not like they've come out and said hey look what we developed from the ground up okay i wasn't aware i was thinking that was on a toyota platform because pro ace i you know i associate the word pro ace with like a japanese uh, market van but and that's actually, and actually that's pretty good. Uh, there's two battery sizes uh, with that. They'll charge at 100 kilowatts. Um, it's uh, it hasn't got crazy weight to it. So if you are using that to transport things, y y you still get a good payload. You don't want the actual vehicle to be so heavy that you can't carry anything in the back of it because of weight limits. And so it's actually it's pretty good. But they've not done too much for that. It's like a 200 mile range with a big battery. Yeah, it's not bad. Something like 330 kilometers, it should around 200 miles, I guess. Yeah, very useful. It's going to be uh, end of this year, next year, and all of those, all of those vans. That that version of the same thing is pretty good, actually, and the pricing is going to be pretty good on it as well. You know what they should electrify is the Toyota Alphard van. This is like the luxury businessman's, you know, you pull up to this thing, it's the equivalent of like rolling up in a Phantom here in New York. Uh, and they just idle around all day long and they're Japanese, like they're perfect. They should make this electric and then sell it in North Carolina so we can have some fun with it because right. they are so cool. So I really hope. If Toyota listens to this, which I doubt they do, but hopefully they, when someone does, please electrify the Alphard and send us one to test. Right. I love the Japanese market vans, man. Oh. Anyway, so moving right along, um, the Tesla Model 3 Stealth version is Tesla Model 3 Performance Stealth version is not a thing you can buy anymore. Can you tell us something about that, Kyle? Right. So for a long time, uh, on the website, on Tesla's website, you can only buy the standard range plus the dual motor long range and the performance version of the Tesla. And then there's those secret off menu things that get very confusing. For a while, you could get a long range rear wheel drive off menu. You could get a standard off menu, which you still can, which is the cheap, you know, $35,000. $35,000, yeah. Then you could get a performance car. But without the big wheels, without the big brakes, without the suspension changes, although it's never really been confirmed if there were ever suspension changes, as far as I'm aware. And then you could, uh, and without the pedals and a few other things. And so essentially all it is, and truly all it is, is a dual motor all wheel drive cranked up to a performance level car in software. My good friend Ben drives one. And it's just as fast. Actually, it's a little bit faster than my performance around the racetrack and uh, probably due to tires and wheels. But we did a whole video on the out of spec channel racing the two. And so it was a great option because it used to be like five or six thousand dollars less than the performance version. So it was like a twenty five hundred dollar bump from a dual motor. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Um, it's you lose nothing other than gaining track mode version two, all the extra power. It was an awesome option. And then recently, Tesla changed it to the point where it was the same exact price as the performance. So for the same money, you could get one with the big brakes, the suspension, the wheels, or you could get one without all that stuff. And no one bought it. So I think they just they canceled it out of confusion. I think it's smart. Uh, the dual motor cars are quick enough. And you'll be seeing this weekend a, a video from our friends at the Electrified Garage, Rich Rebuilds, and, and Chris Salvo, and Chad Henrison. I can never say his last name right. Um, they have been able to, this is huge news, they have been able to tune and crack the code on a dual motor, all-wheel drive, long range to be faster than a performance car, uh, mm. just through software. So uh, again, aftermarket tuning, but we're starting to get into the fun side of EVs with aftermarket speed upgrades, not just visual cosmetic changes. So um, if they can really do this, and we'll find out this weekend, it would only really make sense just to buy a dual motor long range, send it to them to get tuned. They can <laughs> put track mode in it, hopefully, and then you that you have like a performance for like fifteen thousand dollars less after everything's said and done. Well, Elon Can said recently he's a fan of of tuning, so surely he would be in full support of this. <laughs> surely, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, I think you can be in full support and still not warranty the vehicle. Yeah, uh, I, I don't yeah. think it would need to be held liable for drivetrain tuning or anything like that. I I, I feel like 
I could see a warranty claim being voided, but everyone would think it's really cool and we all like it because you should be able to do what you want with your own car. Yeah. Do you, so do you know if they can also get extra juice out of a performance model? Right. So they can basically make a performance to mechanical limitations, which would increase the power of the performance because the Model Y actually outputs more power than the Model 3 performance. Um, mm. And it launches harder than the Model 3. So I think uh, there's definitely some room left on it. And even when you drive the performance cars and you floor it, you can just tell it's very understressed. Like it's fast. Don't get me wrong. But you right. can feel that, you know, it's not like a P100D where when you nail it, things feel like they're going to fall apart because it's right at the mechanical limitations. There's right. a lot of room left on the table with this chassis. Right. The chassis is there, but it is the voltage there, you know, that's the thing. Because when you slam on, when you ask for a ton of current like that, you you know, your voltage can, tends to sag a bit and right. you, you yeah, your the performance pack. limitations uh, there. We did some testing with a Pikes Peak car at a full charge, you know, 405 volt pack, whatever it would be. Uh, wide open power brings you down to like 316, which is more than safe. So you have a lot, a lot of headroom there that you can pull some more out. Now, granted, can the wire bonds on the cells take all that abuse? There's, you know, long, long term longevity testing that will need to go into it. And, you know, there's a reason OEMs make their cars a little bit slower than aftermarket tuners can. It's because. Right. For that one person on a 125 degree day that decides they want to go bomb across the desert, you know, at wide open throttle on fuel made out of water, you know, the cars have to handle that. And same with electric cars, you need to prepare for whatever the cars will go through. But that means you can crank it up and use the extra performance for short bursts. Right on. So while we're talking about the Model 3, uh, there was a bit of controversy this week. So uh, there was a Model 3 in Taiwan that crashed into an overturned semi-truck on the highway. Basically, the, the truck had some sort of accident before that. And, you know, there's a video available of it. You can see the cars like approaching this big white box and, you know, it doesn't seem to see it until, I don't know, it's like 150 feet out or so. And there's a little bit of puff of smoke as you can see the brakes are being applied. Uh, there's been some controversy as to whether or not the car was an autopilot. Uh, in our post on Inside AVs, we, we have sourcing from a news source called uh, Taiwan English News. So I assume that they have the actual scoop because a lot of people are taking uh, this report from the Chinese and uh, publication somewhere and doing the Google Translate and there's some confusion as whether or not the uh, uh, pilot is on, if autopilot is on. But according to the, our source, it was on. And uh, so yeah, there we can see it, it's like pushed right into the back and also people are making a, a deal about the airbags not you know, going off, which I don't think, you know, it doesn't hit it that, I mean, it hits it hard enough to, to go through the roof. But if you know, if you've seen the roof of a, a vehicle like this, a trailer, it's like usually super light material. It's like some aluminum holding some fiberglass together. So it's poked to that, but it's, you know, I don't think there's enough uh, damage or pressure to activate the, um, you know, the pillows or whatever. So yeah, the guy was fine. But uh, yes, what do we what do we think about this it, autopilot it, it, emergency emerg automatic emergency braking? Was there a failure here? It looked it looked spectacular because of what it was. As you say, those trucks are made. The, the, it's so flimsy what they're made out of. Um, but also, the, it looks spectacular because the car does lock up the brakes before it hits it. It's on CCTV from a ton of angles, which lends itself naturally to going viral on social media. And of course, the fact checking is hard. So. The, the, the headline is Tesla on autopilot slams into truck. Well, look, no one was hurt. And also, uh, people say, well, the, the system should have spotted it. No, the driver should have spotted it. You're driving two tons of metal very, very fast. Stop it, Tesla drivers. Stop it. Whatever you're doing in your car at that time, you deserve whatever comes to you. So this person should absolutely be prosecuted for not paying due care and attention. I'm glad he's not hurt. I'm glad no one else is hurt. But they should send the bill to him or her. And uh, it's like if it's a, it's a guy, make him pay it. 
What are you doing in the outside lane of a, of, a, of a road going that fast in any piece of machinery? Stop listening to Elon Musk. Yeah, he's going to make us all live on Mars and drive cars that will go across the country on their own. Uh, it's all magical technology, isn't it? No, stop it. These cars are not magical pieces of equipment. And, and, and the outrage this week on social media was because everyone expects them to be everybody expects a tesla on autopilot to handle every possible situation i must admit a truck falling over in a lane it probably should spot shouldn't it but yeah. come on it's not perfect cal are you familiar with the automatic the aeb systems yeah very familiar we've done a lot of testing with it here at the track it's very difficult for sensor technology just with mostly radar to pick up a object that is stopped on the highway. So if you have a radar, just for example, and, and we'll get into the camera systems on autopilot and I'll keep it very brief. You could have a soda can lying in the road and that to the radar system looks like a brick wall. So the car needs to have some sort of false positive control. And basically it's, is this a plausible situation or not based on the data I'm receiving and seeing a giant billboard in the lane when there's no other cars around you, probably not that plausible. Then you add in the sensor technology of uh, cameras. In this case, you know, it uses vision. So it's saying, okay, I see an object. Is this a billboard, a low hanging billboard that's only going to be about six, seven feet above the car? Is it a car parked on the shoulder? It's big and white. I, that doesn't look like a car that stopped. What is this thing? And then as it gets closer, it starts to figure it out. And at the last second, it goes, oh my God, there's something in the road. Let me slam on the brakes. You're already doing 80 miles an hour and you slam into it. So this is one of the hardest things you'll notice if you're on autopilot or any uh, vehicles, you know, adaptive cruise control system coming up to stopped cars. It has a really hard time seeing it because it's doing this false positive checking constantly. Otherwise, you know, the manufacturers could tune it where it would say every time there's something stopped slammed on the brakes. But that means every time you go under an underpass, it slams on the brakes, which it already does with phantom braking. Everyone complains about that. You crash into a truck. Everyone complains about that. There's really, you know, there's no uh, happy medium here. So the, the answer is object recognition and multiple sensor technologies. In and, fact, and, a LiDAR may have helped this situation. Right. But in, and this isn't just a situation with Tesla's uh, automatic uh, emergency braking. Every manufacturer has, you know, their, their systems have different limitations. Some of them are better at different speeds. I think possibly Mercedes or Jaguar, I forget which, has a, a pretty high limit on their speed, which you know, they should react to something like this. But uh, right. obviously... So the AEB system will take over no matter the drive state the car is in. Uh, autopilot will trigger automatic emergency braking, even with autopilot on. They operate as ses uh, separate systems That's so right. that there's always a checkup. And so whether the driver was on autopilot or driving manually, the car, uh, I'm not saying it should, but it has the capability to detect stopped objects in some scenarios where it then can apply braking to reduce the impact. It never says it will avoid accidents anywhere in the materials, right. it's just to reduce the severity of the impact. And it, it honestly, it probably did what it was designed to do. It reduced the severity. I mean, whether it was the driver or the car that slammed on the brakes there with that patch of dirt, the car was braking. Uh, just way too late. And, but, uh, you know, as Martin said, it just comes down to drivers paying attention. You know, people, you see t people on autopilot all the time on their phones, you know, head over. It's just a level two system. We really need to pay attention here. That's true. But we do see people without autopilot also on their phones and, and people, you know, without autopilot or maybe just on cruise control going on the highway, they hit stuff in the road because they're not paying attention either. You know, I've seen people reading books. You yeah, know, going down the, going I saw a guy on the laptop the state. other day driving a Tahoe. I'm like, what are you doing? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, on the uh, on, on InsideEVs.com, I thought I'd go and see what the the conversation was from people, and uh, not in the forum, but in the the comment section to the article that we posted. And uh, the first comment is from a, a guy called Nicholas, who says, "Why was the driver not paying attention?" And the follow up comment from Johnny. Uh, says because that's the point of autopilot uh, not having to pay attention otherwise oh. just drive the car yourself no johnny you are driving the car even on any kind of driver assistance if you hit a person you are responsible for for harming another human being stop handing it over to the computers they aren't the robots are not in control yet it's like um myself for myself even like um 
uh, just like cruise control. If it's raining out, I, I won't drive with cruise control on just because if I start to hydroplane, I, I want to be able to, feel, I want to know exactly, have all that pedal feel and know exactly what's going on. So I can, you know, take and take, have always have as much of control as, you know, as possible in the situation. I use autopilot a lot. It works so well until it doesn't. And you have to understand you, if you have a Tesla, if you're using autopilot, you have to constantly be watching what's going on around. You have to be alert every now and then. Can you, for a split second, take your eyes off, off, off the road? You can, chances are you can do that, not have any problem, but not for long. You can't be reading. You can't be doing full on on texts because it only takes that split second for you to have this huge problem. I've had two instances already with my car in one, the one year that if I wasn't, fully prepared to immediately take over, I would have hit something. So, um, you know, it's the system works great, but it's not there yet. And, uh, you know, people have to understand they have to be watching what's going on around them. That's right. So let's uh, move past that for right now. And we got a few other things real quick. Let's, let's see if we can just plow through them. So we talk about them a little bit. Um, so quickly, Tesla is reportedly building a plant in the UK, which may or may not be a gigafactory. Uh, we've seen some reports on this, and apparently the internet sleuths have tracked Elon's private jet in the UK. So maybe there's something, something to this. Martin, what do you what do you know about this? Yeah, I should probably UK. take this one as I'm uh, in in the UK. Um, yeah, so not too far away from me. I live in the southwest of England. Uh, Somerset is a county. It's not the most populous part of the, of the UK. Um, it's pretty far away from moving goods. As in, if you're going to move goods into mainland Europe, it's not. So the southeast would be a good choice, but it's pretty built up and very expensive. So, you know, there's some shipping I guess you could use. It's kind of weird. We're in this process of trying to negotiate Brexit by the end of the year, and that is nowhere near being done at the moment. So as, a, as any business is trying to make their investment plans on a, a mid to long term time scale, you just don't know how easy or difficult it's going to be to move goods in or out of the country. So I'm not sure this is Tesla making any kind of consumer goods that are then going to be exported around the world. Unless it's the kind of goods that are made which don't have the same turnaround as a car. So you're not making, you know, three, four, five thousand cars a week and you need constant shipping out of a, of, of a gigafactory, a constant stream of, of car carriers uh, with them all loaded up because putting that in the southwest is, is not, it's a, just a long way from anything. So could they be doing something else? where you're having shipments leave once a week and i'm looking at you power walls power packs they could do but i mean they've got a lot of space already uh you have uh buffalo um obviously there's nevada there's everything that's happening in shanghai and berlin the the the, the rumors were the site size is somewhere between shanghai and berlin which is but berlin's the biggest one i gather uh, in terms of how many hundreds of acres and so yeah it's possible but uh, I, I remain really skeptical and yes the stalkers on the flight apps did track elon's private jet doesn't mean elon was on it could have been a you know a, a, a vp a senior manager of tesla coming in to do a deal but maybe elon did fly into the uk for a, a few hours a couple of days ago to sign something to help negotiations along he's certainly a you know, uh, uh, the the right person to walk into a meeting room to get to knock a few heads together uh, to get things happening. I'd be amazed if anything was happening in this country, though, just because of the sheer economic uncertainty around us leaving the trading block that is the European Union. And all of that is so up in the air at the moment. Saying that, you know, never underestimate governments offering subsidies and incentives to to companies to get business in it would be a big headline to get a company like tesla they're not going to make cars here in a million years uh but not, not, even, not even for like the right hand market like uh japan and australia the uk well i mean i mean that's small you, berlin isn't that far away the thing is right. about assembling assembling cars and admittedly teslas probably have fewer parts than some other cars but even then the 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 just in time assembly of 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 autos is not suited to a country like ours, which is now putting the borders up 
and you need to be somewhere uh, like let's well, say the, the the berlin is gigafactory in in an ideal space to bring in all those parts from various european countries so you know putting a car together is 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 an exercise it's a it's a big jigsaw and it's an exercise in bringing all the parts in at just the right time and not storing them i can't yeah. see tesla i just can't see tesla doing that in a in a country that is is completely up in the air in terms of it's what true. we're going to do with our borders at the end of this year um i i don't but maybe it could be some energy things or uh, add into that that Tesla recently applied to be an energy provider in the country. Sure. Uh, and that application uh, was vaguely reported at the start. The headline was they're going to be an energy. They, they want a license to provide energy, which uh, could mean that they wanted to feed into the grid and that big other energy companies could then, you know, perhaps per, maybe like a big, like they've got at Hornsdale, like a big power thing. Um, since then, it's come out that in the application was they, they were applying to supply the ability to supply power to every address in the country. So yeah. maybe they maybe they want to become an electricity provider in this country. I don't know. So, so I'm, a little, I'm a little skeptical of the whole auto angle, but energy products, I could see that, you know, and I know uh, the UK is pretty hungry for business in the midst of all this Brexit uncertainty. So I, mean, I can see them throwing incentives at Tesla to, to make, make anything, you know, put them on the, keep them on the map. Yeah. But, uh, so let's move on, though. Next thing, we uh, see that Rivian has hired a former Tesla employee to deploy its public fast chargers. Uh, it's going to be called the Rivian Adventure Network. And these are going to be just like its own charging network, but at different locations than where you'd usually see them. Like now you see Tesla uh, superchargers or the Electrify America network at uh you know, outside malls along the interstates, but the Rivian Adventure Network, you're more likely to see, you know, in Yellowstone Park at destinations, at adventure destinations. Uh, Kyle, have you heard about this? Uh, you know, honestly, I have not heard about this, but I am okay. excited hearing about it right now. I think uh, one of the major problems with charging infrastructure at this point is they go to where the people are currently going in masses. Uh, for example, this past week, we took that Pikes Peak Tesla I talked about earlier out to the mountains of North Carolina with my Model 3 performance and a Model Y performance from Brian from i1 Teslas. And so we had three cars going, you know, we had to go to the Asheville supercharger, which is the westernmost supercharger in our state before you get to the mountains. Full charge, 100%. You know, we're there for an hour and a half just waiting. We drive four miles an hour the whole way into the mountains, consuming every last drop. We do 30 miles of ripping around the mountains up and down the roads, or in the case of Rivian, you'd be off-roading. And then we had to limp all the way back to the supercharger, and I think the Pikes Peak car pulled in with 1%. I pulled in with 2 right? And so we had no – and we had level 2 chargers out there, uh, but but nothing close to DC charging infrastructure. And so this project is really exciting because you're able to now drive a Rivian the places you would want to drive your Rivian. And uh, I think that's a really exciting thing. But Tom, you're, you're a charging in network specialist. So what do you think about this? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's great. Uh, I'm not going to duplicate what uh, Kyle had said. So for all the reasons that he's pointing out, I think it's great. I'll focus on the hire, um, which I think is important because – you know, it's sometimes a little frustrating on inside EVs when I see a lot of people comment about how, like, why aren't there charging stations here or how come there's big blackout areas? It's it's a complicated process. You know, I've I've worked with people from ChargePoint, from uh, Electrify America, um, when uh, BMW and Volkswagen were setting up the East Coast and West Coast express charging corridors back in, like, 2015, uh, and the, 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 the amount of time and effort going into site evaluations and then per the permitting process and then dealing with utilities, especially in these remote areas, that's going to be difficult because they have to get power to places where there isn't power. And if there is power, there's not a lot of power. Um, it's, it's, this is a, it's a difficult endeavor. And uh, Rivian understood that they needed to get somebody who's experienced, who'd been doing this for years with the superchargers, and they went out and uh, took them from Tesla. I, I think it's a good move for Rivian. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 it, 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 this is going to require somebody with experience uh, dealing with uh, the utilities, negotiating power contracts and site land leases and so forth. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's great. And I, I'm happy to see Rivian understood that this is probably something they needed help with. And they went out and got the help. Can I can yeah. I ask Tom? Could could this work with in remote locations, solar and storage, or it, would that just be too expensive to have that many batteries? Uh, or is it got to be grid connected to work? Is there any way of doing it uh, with new technology? Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't think we know exactly what the Rivian's plans are. I mean, there be, there'll be some areas where it probably has to be some sort of a um, you know off grid system. Uh, the, the 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 problem with that is you need. You really need a big solar array um, to be able to, to to provide. Don't forget, you know, look at the size of the battery packs in Rivian trucks. You know, if 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 two or three trucks come up to a, a, a remote area like what Kyle just mentioned, where you know the 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 the, the nearest DC fast charger was say 100 or 120 miles away or 150 miles away, by the time the people arrive in their Rivian trucks that want to go have some camping or have some fun, you know, the, the, they're going to need to pump you know, 50, 100, maybe 150 kilowatt hours into their battery, two or three trucks lined up like that. You're talking 500 kilowatt hours of, uh, of energy storage. Uh, and then how long will it take for those battery plaques to be replenished so somebody else can use them? Unless you have an enormous, um, a pretty large solar array there, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to really work all that well. It, it'll work well if one car comes up and needs to trickle charge for a while but uh, I think we're still a little ways off from having really good systems that can can be self-sustaining in, in, in super mm. remote areas. Hopefully, they'll be able to work out deals with the utilities. You know, even if it costs, you know, many uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for them to bring in power from from uh, the nearest area. Yeah. Uh, so sticking with Rivian, they've also decided to. Uh, roll out their own insurance policies. Uh, apparently, they're hiring, so looking to hire some people to set up a whole insurance, Rivian insurance arm for their vehicles. It's kind of, a, I think Tesla is doing the same thing right now. So that's, it's um, kind of a unique thing for automakers to have their own insurance. Uh, are you familiar with this, Kyle? Yeah, I, uh, I read that article. I saw that you even uh, put a link to the hiring page or whoever wrote it did. And um, I think it, it's an interesting thing. I Personally, I think Tesla insurance uh, is only available in California right now, okay. uh, or at least select markets. So it's not a, a, a countrywide thing. Um, some people had claimed that it was a better deal for them than their normal or not. I think in my case, they would have access to the car's uh, systems and they'd see how I drive it and they wouldn't want to insure me anymore. So, you know, that I would be concerned about. Um, I'm sure there's some clause in there where they can't look at your data, but still, I mean, it's nice to have that separated. Um, I, I think maybe what they're going for is more of a subscription service. And again, they haven't mentioned anything like this, but at Volvo, for example, they uh, you can go and get a Volvo XC40 as part of Volvo's subscription. You literally do a monthly subscribe like a Spotify account. It comes with maintenance, insurance, everything included in one bundle. Uh, they could potentially be taking this angle, very much speculation, uh, but I could see them having some business models where insurance is important and uh, maybe they just want to insure their own cars for the company. So we're all kind of guessing here. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that, with that, by the way, because I think people get very carried away by seeing a, 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 a two job posts. for it. One came out this week in the UK for Tesla. Tesla in the UK looking for an insurance manager. It was oh. yesterday or day before, right? Have you driven past an insurance company's building headquarters recently? There's more than two people inside it. <laughs> you know, we get very carried away and say, oh, my goodness, they're going to be, you know. What this is, as I think Kyle says, is very likely that remember that Rivian invested in by Amazon, going to be making 10,000 of their vans a year from 21, 22. And they might well be looking at other uh, commercial aspects of saying, look, could we offer a van, whatever they call it, the R1V, can we offer the, the van to businesses and wrap in maintenance, insurance, running costs for a flat fee, for a subscription? For that, you'd need one or two insurance specialists in the company, maybe. 
Yeah, I, 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 I envision a, a really more comprehensive insurance program, maybe not to begin with, but eventually, but I guess it could be just part of a subscription program to begin. Um, it would be another revenue stream. So that's, you know, insurance money, insurance companies make money and insurance costs, man, they're all over the place. You read some forms of uh, motor, electric motorcycles, electric vehicles, it's some some companies just ask crazy money for insurance. It's kind of ridiculous. So this is also makes it easier, lowers the, uh, the price of admission to electric vehicle ownership if the company's taking care of that. So you, you dropped another clue in there, Martin. So this week, uh, Rivian also registered a couple new vehicle names, the R1V and the R2X. So I, we believe the R1V is a van. Is that... Uh, are you familiar uh, with that? Likely, right? Because they've got to call the Amazon van something. Uh, you know, it would it would fit. I like actually that. Uh, I thought maybe R one T, R one S. They might have been. They're nice, but uh, if they're going to go down that route of the R one something, I, I that's really nice for a product a product range. The R one V for the range uh, is uh, for the. Uh, for the for the van uh, is good. We know that they're gonna they, the Amazon vans are gonna have uh, good specs, good range, a hundred a thousand of them on the road by twenty thirty. But that's sort of roughly divided over uh, eight years or so. Uh, so that number isn't quite as impressive as it as it sounds because they've got a decade to achieve that. Um, but actually, could they then sell that to to other companies? Well, you think they would because Amazon aren't just a customer; they're an investor, right. and. Uh, uh, it, you, you know, it's it's highly likely that that's what this is going to be. The R two X. I couldn't work out any any ideas what that is. I think that's going to be a crossover because they had mentioned that their next vehicle is going to be like a uh, what do you call it? like an autocross kind of crazy vehicle, so like a smaller hatchback. And when I see the X, I, I think um, I think crossover. And when I see the two, I'm thinking a second iteration of their skateboard. So, you know, on a new platform that's, you know, and, and just to step back really quickly to the van, um, is, is that, you think, is that the, um, the Amazon version, that, is that going to be on the same uh, skateboard as the R1S and R1T? It would make sense, but I don't know the answer. You guys, I do you know? I don't believe so. It's I got could be own. totally wrong, but I, I remember thinking at least that it was a totally new design from the ground up. Right, I need to straighten that up in my mind too because I'm thinking it was going to be originally I thought it was going to be completely different. Then, then I'm thinking, well, maybe did I read something that it was going to be on the R1T? Yeah, yeah. but uh, it would be interesting to see a consumer version of the of the Amazon van because, yeah, be a nice like a, a van, and then you could have a, a van turn into a recreation vehicle, and that's like a, a piece of the uh, the market that you know be begging for electrification but uh any, tom would you like to see a crossover like a crazy high performance crossover <laughs> with off-road capabilities well i agree with your assessment and martin's i think that's what we're looking at the v for the van and the x for some sort of a crossover it fits into their product line uh you know and and uh that's the type of vehicles that a lot of families are going for you know so uh that makes the most sense to me. And, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, Rivian will do something cool with it. You know, it's, uh, it's so, it's good. It's so far down the road. I can't get too excited about that yet. Just trademarking a name. Um, let, let, let's get the darn truck and the SUV out first and see how good they are. But, you know, so far Rivian seems to be really putting together some compelling vehicles. I'm sure the crossover will be too. Uh, you know, that, that might be, you know, besides a pickup truck, a, a crossover, would be something that I'd really like right now. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be a potential customer for that. Well, they're back at work now. And so hopefully, uh, I think they're, they lost maybe two months. So the R1T electric pickup truck should be out the first part of 2021. And of course, we're all looking forward to that. So mm -hmm. moving right along real quick, we just want to touch on a couple things. There's a Vietnamese company called VinFast who's got a Pininfarina designed EV it's coming to the U.S. for 2021. That's next year. Man, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but uh, apparently they already make a few different vehicles, like gas-powered vehicles as well. 
and they sell they sold like five thousand i think i'm not sure what the time frame is but in vietnam their home market and, and there we can see it on the screen if you're watching on youtube you can see the uh, vehicle there it's covered in camouflage so we don't have a lot of detail but it's got the slit lights across the front you know it should it should look well but man starting a company and and just coming out of nowhere and expect to sell in any numbers in the u.s and I believe he's got like a $2 billion investment to kind of make this happen. But is that enough, do you think, Tom? Well, to answer the money about, is that enough? Hell no. <laughs> right. Everybody thinks they have enough. And then, uh, you know, the I remember um, Elon telling a story about when he started Tesla, how the original Tesla founders told him, uh, you know, we just need $50 million and we can get the roadsters on the road. And he said it was, I think it was something like, 200 million later, we weren't even close to, uh, to it. And, uh, right. I had, to, you know, kind of become more active. So, you know, uh, 2 billion doesn't buy uh, what it used to anymore. That's <laughs> um, right. you know, I wish them all the luck. I, and, you know, we're going to see so it's a, such exciting time now in the automobile industry. We're going to see these startups popping up all over the place. Most of them probably won't make it. Uh, the ones that will, you know, will, 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 will form, you know, the, the, the whole basis for this new mobility that we're era that we're going to be, uh, you know, entering in now it's exciting times. So, you know, more the merrier, bring them on, let the strong survive and, uh, the weak will die off. Can, can I, can I just say that, uh, Sir James Dyson, the richest man in the country here is worth 16 billion pounds, $19 billion. And, uh, Dyson's a privately owned company. And after spending half a billion trying to get a car out the door, he, he knocked that on the head and he is not short of money, but he sees that you can, you know, he's, he was every check that's written at Dyson being a pro is got his name on. And, yeah. uh, after half a billion, he's like, nah, no more. I'm not doing it. I'm getting out of this business. And, and yeah. he's got some money. Martin, if I read that correctly, they actually invested almost a billion, like something like 900 million total. I think it was half a billion of his money. So yeah. I think that vehicle had close to a billion dollars into it. 500 employees that built, they were building the factory already in uh, Singapore. Uh, this was a, it's a very serious project and he's been designing goods for uh, 20, 30 years and, and he knows when to call it a day. And he's like, <laughs> I can't do it. I'm getting out of it. And he, I think he would have been you know, better set up for success than say VinFast here because, you know, people know Dyson, they, you know, we have a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Everyone has a Dyson. Well, you know, it's, it's a household name. So it's not like you have to introduce, you know, it's, and, and it's from the UK, which is, you know, re relatively tr a trusted, you know, we know nothing of Vietnam manufacturing here really. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, gray box. We don't know what's inside that, but yeah. So good luck with the VinFast, you know, it looks like it, it might be an attractive vehicle, but man, that's a, that's, that's a tough road. That's a tough road to hoe. So, uh, but speaking of new vehicles, Audi is launching a, a project called the Artemis Project, and they they want to uh, produce a highly efficient EV by 2024, I believe. And it's like this is a whole agile unit for additional car projects outside the, the main development uh, schemes. And it looks like the person it's it's uh, for Audi, but it looks like. The person behind the, the project, uh, he used to be in charge of the autonomous vehicles for Volkswagen Group. So he may also have access to a lot of the technology within the Volkswagen Group itself. So, and I mean, if Audi produces like, you know, a special vehicle here, there's like not a small chance that it will get shopped around to all the other brands within the Volkswagen Group. So Martin, have you seen this? <laughs> Well, yeah, of course, Audi have got to make a more efficient um, vehicle because their first attempt was luxurious, but not efficient. Right. And by 2024, so you're three years away. But of, course, of course, they've got to work on something better than what they've done. They made The e-tron is great and it's luxurious. It's three and a half tons and it and, and it's it's not going to win any range uh, awards. So, of, of course, you've got to get a, a team together of people and go, come on, like we're getting left behind here. So Kyle, you have thoughts on this? Uh, not really. I just think we'll wait till we drive it, drive it, and do a, a range test. But at this point, it's just, eh, you know, they. I, I think they could honestly make a semi truck more efficient than an e tron. So it would, it won't take much. 
Right. Well, I mean, Audi's, so their first e-tron was, you know, not super efficient and, you know, it's, it's got decent sales in Europe, but uh, the, really the, the main thrust of their electric vehicle program is on the MEB platform, which is shared throughout Volkswagen and you have, you know, Skoda and Volkswagen and I, I can't even keep up with all the Volkswagen brands, but there's a, a bunch of them all, and everything's on the MEB platform. So this would be on top of all that as well. But so, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, yes. One thing about that, Dom, I just want to add quickly. Sure. So, um, you know, Martin mentioned uh, the efficient need to make the car more efficient. I think this program has two purposes. Number one is to increase efficiency, but number two, it's also to increase the agility of the company to shorten the life cycle of, pen, uh, pe you know, pencil to pavement. And this is something that I've had discussions with many of the existing OEMs dating back, you know, to seven, eight, nine years ago when electrification was just starting to take off. I remember talking to one um, very high member of an established luxury brand and what he told me was one of the most difficult things we're going to face now with electrification is it's going to force us to compress our cycle from d just, you know, a vehicle on a paper to, to the time it's in the showroom. He said, we're, we're for years, we were used to a five to seven year gestation period. And we're adjusting now to a four to six year gestation period where, you know, we come up with a concept. This is a vehicle six, five to six years later, it's on the road. And he said, within around 2020, we're going to have to start compressing that to two to four years. And he said, you, you don't understand how difficult that is going to be for us, but we know it's coming and electrification is going to force us to do that. So I think this is happening in all of the companies right now. Audi just happened to come out and tell us that they're, that they're doing this, that, um, you know, part of this program, I think the main part of this program isn't even the make the cars more efficient. I mean, that was going to come anyway. I think this program is really dedicated to, to, to developing methods to be able to shorten the time that it takes them to come up with a concept to the time that vehicle's on the road. Yeah, Tom, you're absolutely correct. I think, um, you know, I've spoken to some some Volkswagen Audi Group executives like you had mentioned, and it's like, okay, let's do this. Okay, so we'll have this meeting, which then goes to this meeting, and then we need to pitch it to the board, and they're all just, you know, hanging out, and then, oh, the food's here. So, you know, it just takes so long to get these things done. That's what Tesla's done so well. It's what Rivian, I think, will do well. Um, you know, because Audi has, like, crazy jobs that they have, like, the executive director of Headlight daytime running light design, right? You have 9,000 people working on parts that don't matter. Um, really, they just need to simplify, totally cut down. You know, you could probably get rid of 75% of the team and still have about six times as many people as Tesla does and produce a really nice product. So I, I hope this project uh, really shows the Germans how to become a little bit more efficient with their, their design to, uh, to production. Do, do you think the, the the issue here might be that car makers became really good? I mentioned this earlier that that phrase, like really good at putting the jigsaw puzzle together. But car makers generally don't make anything; like they don't produce anything. So with EVs, the key part is the battery, which Tesla took a very keen interest very early on in how to put a pack together. So they've got those competencies, and the point is the car makers couldn't go to the marketplace to say. Right, who's going to supply us 400,000 battery packs and inverters and cooling? And, you know, because if that market was there, I think they would have all been putting together great EVs. There's just no one to supply them. And actually, the car makers have got, have through the process of natural selection, just became really, really good at being assembly companies and branding and marketing companies. Uh, but because they don't actually make anything themselves anymore, you go to the market to say, what can we get? The answer is nothing. It's it's too embryonic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I see that the uh, EVs have made companies look at becoming more vertically integrated than they have been. You know, instead of because you can't outsource, like you say, batteries. So now, you know, like GM is you know hooking up with LG to produce their own you know supply chain of batteries and packs, and 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 other other companies are having to do the same thing. And with this Artemis project too, I think a big component actually we didn't really mention is the autonomous vehicle uh, thing. I think this is 
probably a, there's a large autonomous vehicle component to this Artemis project that they're not really talking about because, you know, there are no autonomous vehicles yet. And so, yeah, you don't want to get too ahead of your skis on that, right? Okay, um, so we should wrap up pretty quickly. I just wanted to say also uh, in other other news, uh, Lordstown Motors uh, pickup truck uh, company startup. They've landed another order for 900 vehicles, and they'll hopefully be revealing that vehicle of theirs within the next few weeks. And that's going to be built beginning next year. And they have the old uh, GM Lordstown plant that they're they're working on renovating to make that happen. And that's a 200 mile vehicle with uh, in wheel motors, uh, EPA limited. Uh, with the top speed limited to 80 miles an hour. Uh, yeah. And also you can now buy a brand new Jaguar I-Pace for $20,000 off, which is a really incredible deal and makes it, uh, you know, if you're thinking about picking up a Model Y, it's worth taking a look at this and seeing if this will fulfill your needs as well or better because the price point is uh, arguably very competitive now. And um, yeah, and that's about it for the week. That brings us to the end of, your, end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And if you have any comments on today's show, you can uh, leave them on the Inside DB's podcast post or in the comments here at on YouTube or on the podcast thread over on the Inside DB's forum. Uh, you can find and follow all of our panelists here on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Martin is at EV News Daily, and Kyle is at Out of Spec. I'm not going to call you Ryan. And I am at Dominic underscore Y. So uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week, streaming live at 9.30 in the morning. All right.